Thank you, Kyle and worship team. Well, hey, if you have your Bibles with you, open up to Matthew chapter 14. Uh, Matthew chapter 14. So today uh, I'm preaching what I call a standalone sermon. Uh, so this is kind of a one-time sermon out of a one-time passage kind of thing. Uh, but in two weeks on Father's Day, we are starting a new uh, summer sermon series through the Psalms. And I'm super excited about this. Uh, the title of the series is called The Songs We Sing. And so what we're going to do uh, for seven weeks, we are going to look at seven different Psalms all dealing with different types of emotion that we experience. So the Psalms uh, is really a roller coaster of emotion. Uh, it, it helps us and coaches us uh, to deal with our emotions properly before God and before others, and also internally as well. And so I am so excited uh, to go through those seven different Psalms with you. Uh, we're going to talk about everything from joy to depression and everything in between. So it's going to be really good uh, this summer. That starts on uh, Father's Day. So today we're in Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 through 33. And before we dive into that, uh, let's pray and ask the Lord to bless his word today. Jesus, again, we're so thankful that we get to be here with you, that you are present with us that you are in our midst because you live inside of us who know you. And so we're so thankful that we have your word. You have spoken to us. There's no confusion, Lord. You have revealed yourself clearly to us through your word. And I pray today that that word and the clarity of it would speak to our hearts and our minds and that you would shape us into the people we need to be for the glory of your kingdom, for the glory of you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, my son Barrett is turning four years old on Tuesday, and he's really excited to be four, uh, but he's also really into pirates right now. Most of that is stemming from his obsession with the Peter Pan movie, uh, but he is super excited and always dresses up like a pirate, and he, he's just really into pirates right now. So we thought it'd be fun uh, to take him on a pirate cruise. Now, just curious, anybody ever been on the pirate cruise in St. Augustine? Yes, okay, I see you, yeah. So uh, good time, good time. So um, <laughs> let, let me explain. So we took him this weekend, my family was in town from Atlanta, and we, we took Barrett for his birthday on this pirate cruise, and, and he was really, really excited, but he was also a little nervous. Uh, he's not quite sure if those pirates are real or pretending, and so one of them is named Captain Hook, all right, and he was very concerned as if this hook was really his, his hand or if his hand was underneath it, right? He's, he's asking me questions like, Daddy, are these pirates real? Are they pretending? Are these just costumes, right? And he was, he was having a good time, but you could see there was this underlying nervousness about him. Now, here's the thing. I was very excited, but I was also nervous too because when we set sail out of the harbor there in St. Augustine, uh, a storm was brewing. And so when I say storm, I mean, it was pretty dark the way our ship was heading. And I'm thinking, why are we going into, into the storm, right? Why are we doing that? I see lightning off in the distance. The guy's joking about how the ship is made of metal. And I'm like, this isn't that funny. <laughs> and so I'm trying to put on my excited face for my four-year-old, but I'm also a little nervous, and I'm not sure that these guys dressed like pirates know what they're doing, Right? So Barrett is trusting me that I'm going to keep him safe from Captain Hook, and I'm trusting these dudes that are going to keep all of us safe on this boat. But in the end, it was all good and fun. It did rain a little bit. Uh, we, the ship didn't go down. We're, we're good. Uh, but Barrett, just so you know, he did walk around St. Augustine all day uh, dressed as a pirate and threatening to hit people with his foam sword. So some parenting issues we'll have to work through. But <laughs> let's just say... On that pirate ship this weekend, there was a lot of mixed emotions, right? And at times, it seemed that for me and Barrett, our uncertainty outweighed our trust as we moved forward on that boat into those unknown waters, at least to what was unknown to us as never having that experience before. But I think if we're all honest with ourselves, I, I think we all carry 
with us a mixed bag of emotions as we move into the unknowns of life. You see, fear and doubt, fear and doubt come very naturally to humans, right? They come naturally to us because we're sinful people. And so we're not inclined to trust our Creator with our lives. We're actually inclined to do the very opposite. It's natural for us to think about all the things that could go wrong. It's natural for us to be overwhelmed with with fear and doubt in the midst of the unknowns of our lives as we are moving forward, not sure what the storm ahead is going to do. So when we receive a disappointing diagnosis from our doctor, when there's a challenge at work and, and we just don't know how we're going to get through that, when there's an issue with your child and and you don't know how you're going to parent them through that, when the finances are strained and, and you're not sure if you're going to be able to make ends meet, in all those uncertainties of life, in all those unknowns of life, fear and doubt are going to be what is normal to us, which makes it even more so true that trust, trusting God in those moments is going to have to be something that we work at. It's going to have to become a discipline that we train ourselves to do as we listen to the Lord and seek to be obedient to Him through those unknowns. So that means we're going to have to make some conscious decisions to trust in those moments rather than be afraid. And that's exactly what we see here in Matthew chapter 14. We see a wonderful, beautiful, popular story that you've probably heard before if you're familiar with the New Testament and the scriptures of the Bible. But even if you haven't heard this before, I want to encourage you today to take notes and listen very carefully because we're going to look at four different things about trusting God. We're going to get to those things, though, after we walk through this story. I just want you to listen and follow along on the screens with me as we see a story of what it means to trust our God and our Creator in the midst of an unknown circumstance. So that brings us to Matthew chapter 14. Uh, And just to kind of catch you up and understand what's going on here, see, Jesus is is well into his ministry now, and, and he's just performed one of the most amazing miracles of his whole ministry uh, by feeding 5,000 men plus their wives and kids. So you're talking way more than 5,000 people. He did a miracle where he fed them with five loaves of bread and, and two fish. So, so Jesus made the food multiply, right? We can't explain it. We believe and know it happened, but we can't explain it. But he made the food multiply, and he fed the great crowd that was listening to him uh, preach and and teach and following him. And so now they're beside the Sea of Galilee, Jesus and this huge crowd and his disciples. And that brings us to verse 22, and here's what happens next. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side— while he dismissed the crowds. So you've got thousands of people that Jesus has just fed. It's getting late. Jesus knows that him and his disciples are going to have to, to get out for the night you know, and, and get away from these huge crowds because they're overwhelming him. They, they want to make Jesus king. He doesn't want to be their political leader, right? And so he has to get away from these crowds. But what he does, he sends his disciples out into the Sea of Galilee and says, you guys go ahead. You guys go ahead. And now, just imagine that. The the disciples had to wonder, how is Jesus going to meet back up with us? We only have one boat. And there's 12 of us and one of him. He needs to be in this boat with us as we travel to the other side of this sea, this huge lake. But Jesus insists that they go ahead. And so they go ahead. And I think Jesus knew, obviously, what he was going to do. We'll get to that here in the story. Look at verse 23 and 24. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Isn't that interesting that the Son of God, Jesus, fully God and fully man, still 
has this desire on earth in his ministry to pray to God the Father. Man, if Jesus had to pray to God the Father, how much more do we need to discipline ourselves to pray even when we're tired after a long day's work like Jesus had? To pray and seek the Father in prayer for guidance in our lives. Look at this. When evening came, he was there alone on the mountain, right? But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. So Jesus is on the mountain next to the Sea of Galilee, praying by himself, right? And so after praying, he he goes to meet up with his disciples, but they are already probably about three miles out on this huge lake, the Sea of Galilee, and apparently a storm is brewing, so the water is getting choppy, right? Look at verse 25. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. What? (laughs) Whoa, pause, time out. What is happening here? Number one, this is in the middle of the night. So this is the fourth watch, right, in the Roman Empire at the time was between 3 and 6 a.m., Okay, so maybe the disciples are asleep. Maybe one of them is watching, you know, kind of on guard. Maybe they're awake. Who who knows? But between 3 and 6 a.m. after a long day, you know these guys are tired. And they're about probably three miles from shore. And Jesus comes to them walking on water. He is coming to them in the midst of this storm. All right, don't forget there's a storm brewing. You know, you may imagine Jesus just walking calmly on this nice water. There's waves crashing. There's waves crashing. There could be lightning strikes. Maybe that's the only way you would even be able to see in front of you is when the lightning strikes and you just see for a second what's out there. And you see the waves and the wind is just blowing so hard. And Jesus is out there in the middle of that as the God of all creation walking calmly on the water. He's not running in a panic. He's not running in a panic. And you know what else I think is very interesting? I mean, he could have swam, right? I mean, he could have just pulled a Michael Phelps and just swam, right? All the way out there. But he didn't. Why did he not swim? Why is he walking? Because he, as we're about to see, he wants his disciples to know his power. And to believe that he is divine. Look at verse 26. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. I mean, what would you have thought, right? I mean, let's not be too hard on the disciples here. If you see a figure in the dark at 3 a.m. in the morning coming towards your boat on the water, Yeah, you're probably going to think it's a ghost or something like that, right? You see, the disciples had seen Jesus. They had seen him feed people, over 5,000 people, right, with just a little bit of food. They had seen him heal the sick. They had seen him make the blind see. But why in this moment can they not recognize and believe that Jesus is capable of doing something like this? They had already seen him do all those other things, But you see, this is different. This is a feat that defies the laws of nature. This is a feat that is in a very unique way something they have never witnessed before. You see, this is displaying Jesus' power and authority over the entire creation. The winds and the sea obey this person. Verse 27, 28. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Now, Jesus identifies himself here, and Peter responds. But you know, you know, I just taught through 1 Peter. We, we, we went through the whole letter, and we talked a lot about Peter. I preached about Peter on Easter, and and we're going to hear about him one more time today before we do away with Peter for a little while, right? (laughs) But here's the thing about Peter. Here's what we've learned. Peter's the kind of guy who would jump out of the boat. You know what I mean? Like, he would. He would do that, 
he would just jump out. I mean, he's the kind of guy who previously was probably like, hey guys, watch this, and just does a backflip, right, off into the Sea of Galilee. He is that kind of guy. But this is not the only time in Scripture where Peter jumped out of a boat, by the way, in John chapter 21. I preached about that on Easter, if you remember, if you were here. He jumped out of that boat to get to Jesus. You see, there's something in Peter's heart, man. Is he a little, you know, is he a little flippant and, and irrational and, and just makes rash decisions sometimes? Yeah, he is. But there's something in Peter's heart, man, that loves the Lord and wants to be with him. So you got to give Peter some credit here. This shows faith. This shows trust in his heart. But the storms of life here are showing us that Peter, Peter in those moments, right, he is trusting the Lord. And look what verse 29 and 30 says. Jesus said, he said, come. So, so Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. Peter's walking on the water now. But when he saw the wind, verse 30, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. See, Jesus invites Peter to step out in faith. And Peter does what was probably unthinkable to all the other disciples in the boat, right? I mean, they have to be looking at him like, are you really going to do that? Are you really going to get out of the boat right now in this storm and try to walk on water? You're crazy. But Peter, even though he has this great faith to get out of the boat, as he's walking on the water miraculously, as God's given him the power to do so, he takes his eyes off Jesus and begins to sink. Verse 31. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And Jesus lovingly and graciously extends his hand to Peter and, and pulls him up out of the water. Verse 32 33. And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Man, what an awesome story. What an awesome account. So what I want us to see today is just like Peter getting out of that boat into the unknown, how can we trust God into the unknowns of our lives? And when I say unknown, I mean anything, great or small that brings fear or doubt. It just strikes that fear in you. You feel yourself getting anxious when you think about what you're going to have to do or when you think about what you're going to have to say or you think about that experience that awaits you. Whatever the unknown is, and you may be in it right now, but whatever it is, whatever is the fear and the doubt that is driving that, I want to give us four things today from this story, four things we must consciously do to trust God with our unknowns. Number one is this. Man, we have to believe in his power. We have to believe in the power of God and never underestimate it. We have to believe that God is sovereign over the storm, that he orchestrates the circumstances of life to shape us into who we need to be, to shape our faith. You see, the storms of life are orchestrated by God. And when I say they're orchestrated by God, what I mean is he is the great conductor of this life, of this world, of your life. And so, yes, we believe that God is so powerful that he can cause circumstances in your life to go certain ways in order to change who you are, to get your attention sometimes, to shape you, to bring you to a point where you turn away from your sin, you repent of it, and you turn to him in greater faith and trust. Yes, absolutely, we believe God is all-powerful, which means he has the capability and the power to orchestrate, to control our circumstances in a way where we are shaped by his goodness and his power. The storms of life are orchestrated by him, but what are we tempted to do? We are tempted to remain in a safe place. We're tempted to remain in the boat, if you will, Yet he calls to us and he asks us to come and follow him. You see, only a sovereign God can do that. Only the kind of God who can walk on water can orchestrate your life and call you to follow. 
He's a sovereign God who finds us and wants us to know his power, to really believe in it. But why are the disciples so afraid? I mean, they've followed Jesus now for uh, you know, a long time, and they've seen him heal people. They've seen him do other miracles. Why are they so afraid in this moment if they're dealing with the God of all creation who controls the seeds? Well, it's unbelief. They don't believe really in his power. I think, just like the disciples, sometimes we're too quick to attribute power to something like a ghost or something else in this world besides Jesus, but we're too slow to attribute power to Jesus himself. So what I mean is, you know, maybe sometimes we're, we're just too quick to believe in some other kind of supernatural force or tall tales and, I, you know, think aliens, right, or, or UFOs. Right? Maybe we're like, well, you know, there could be aliens, but I don't know if God can really help me in this situation, right? I mean, what? Right? Sometimes we hear these super abnormal human feats of power that, that people do, and we say, oh, did you hear about this? Well, I don't know if I really believe that, right? And then sometimes we believe in these conspiracy theories of crazy things that we know aren't true. We believe in things quickly, and we attribute power to things in this world. We're so quick to do that, yet... Yet, we're so slow to believe that God can bring healing in our lives, that God can do a miracle in our lives, that God can change our hearts, or that God can lead someone that doesn't know him, that's ran away from him for years, and lead them to himself. Why are we so quick to attribute power to all these other man-made things, but we're so slow to recognize our God for who he really is? The idea of God coming to our rescue sounds crazy sometimes, but we cannot forget who God is. He's not a God of ancient Rome built by human hands. He's not a statue that people bow down and pray to in India right now in Hindu temples. He's not a false God that we have to wonder and go to sleep at night wondering if he will bless us or take care of us. He is the one true God. And he has all the power in the universe, yet we're so quick to forget that. We cannot doubt his power. He's already given you plenty of reasons in your life to trust his power. We cannot forget. We must believe deeply in the all-powerful God who knows us and loves us. We have to make that conscious Effort, number one, if we're going to trust God in the unknowns of life. Number two, we have to be comforted by his presence. We have to be comforted by the fact that he is with us through the storms. You see, when Jesus appears on the water here, his presence and his words are comforting and assuring to these disciples. And you know why? There's something so cool here that, that we don't hear about very often. When Jesus says, don't be afraid, he says, it is I that phrase, it is I, is, the same, is translated the same way so that it means he's basically saying, I am. Now, where have we heard God show up in a weird spot before and say to someone, I am who I am? In the burning bush, right? In Exodus, when, when God shows up, his voice speaks to Moses in that burning bush and he says, I am. The great I am. That means, that's a, you see, that's an eternal statement. God is saying to Moses, as he is saying to his disciples in the middle of that storm on the Sea of Galilee, I am who I am. In other words, that is a statement of eternality. That means that I have always existed. There was none before me. I am an eternal being in control of all things. I am the great I am, Jesus says to Moses and the disciples. And so when those disciples who know the Old Testament and know the story of the burning bush and Moses so well, like the back of their hand, when they hear that, should that not be the most comforting words in the universe? The great I am is with them in the storm. Our God is one we should tremble before, yes, yes but not out of terror because he is good and he intends to do, to do good to us and for us. 
You know, the greatest fictional stories of human history are, are filled with powerful creatures, right? Which are terrifying. So you just think of some of your favorite you know, stories. They, they involve dragons, right? That are terrifying. Beasts, werewolves, right? Baby shark from the baby shark song, right? It's terrifying to me. I have nightmares about it because I hear it all the time. But why are all these things so terrifying to us? Because those creatures that man has thought up of, right, they intend to do us harm. They are truly evil and terrifying. But our God, though he may seem terrifying at first because of all the power he has, when Peter hears his voice, he is comforted in that moment. Because the great I am the eternal God who controls the storm is with you and he is for you. Like I said a few weeks ago, you know, it'd be one thing, it'd be one thing if God was all powerful, but not necessarily good or had your best interest in mind. Like, that's not really a God you can trust. Okay, he's powerful, but is he really going to do good for you? But on the flip side of that, what if God is good and he intends to do good for you, but he doesn't have the power to carry it out? Well, that God's not trustworthy either. But the one true God of the Bible is both. He is all-powerful and all-good. And so in the storms of life, in those moments of the unknown, when we realize that our God is with us, we know that, number one, he has the power And number two, he is for us. So we are comforted by his presence in our lives because he is both. His presence in our unknowns, no matter how difficult they may be, can assure us that in the end, it's all going to be all right. Psalm 23 verse 4 says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The third thing we see in this story, the third conscious effort we're going to have to make if we're going to trust God in the unknowns of life is number three, we have to follow his voice. We have to follow his voice. He tells the disciples from a distance from the boat, take heart or take be courageous, take heart. It is I, do not be afraid. And he tells Peter, when Peter asks if he could come out there, he tells Peter what? He says, come. Jesus invites Peter to come. And Peter, what? He doesn't start asking more questions. Peter doesn't start asking more questions. God's word in that moment was enough for Peter to get out of his place of safety and to follow Jesus into the unknown. God's voice, you see, here's the thing. God's voice is, is not mystical or unknown, right? Sometimes, you know, you'll hear people say, well, I'm trying to figure out what, you know, God wants me to do. And, you know, I've been looking up at the stars and, you know, they've been aligning pretty interestingly recently, you know, or, or I've been, you know, uh, looking in my alphabet soup and it spelled out what I should do, you know, like it's not, God's not mystical like that, right? God is very clear, you know how we know he's clear with his intentions and, his, and what he's calling you to do? He's already told you. It's in his word. It's in what we call the Bible. God has revealed his word, his plans, his commands to us already. So God's voice is known. It's in his word, and the Holy Spirit uses that to speak to us. That's how God speaks to you. As you pray and as you meditate on the word that he's already told you, the Holy Spirit uses that to enlighten you to his truth and to lead you and prompt you where to go and what to do. So in our storms of life, you know, sometimes we go everywhere else. Sometimes we go everywhere else looking for answers before we go to the Bible. Maybe because we think, well, you know, it's, I know the preacher preaches from it. I know we talk about it in our community groups, but does it really have the answers I'm looking for here? Because I don't see it talking about anything about these spreadsheets that I have to do for my boss who is giving me a hard time, right? 
I don't see it anywhere in there talking about what to do if my son is dressed like a pirate, hitting people with swords all over St. Augustine. I don't see anything in there about that. And so I think sometimes we think, okay, well, maybe the Bible's just a little irrelevant right now in this situation, or you know, maybe because we're not used to reading God's Word on a regular basis anyway, we don't even know where to turn. It's just a big book on our bookshelf, and we're like, well, I'm sure there's some helpful stuff in there, but I don't even know where to start. You see, here's the thing I want you to see in this story. Peter was already trained to recognize the voice of God. Peter had been listening to Jesus' voice long before this. So when Jesus calls Peter in the middle of that storm, you see, Peter already disciplined to recognize the voice of Christ, to know his word when he hears it. In that moment, it was a little easier for Peter to get out of the boat and to trust and take Jesus at his word. John 10, 27 says this. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. You see, here's the thing. We, we can't wait. You can't wait until the storm of your life is upon you to get serious about seeking the Lord and his word. If you wait till that point, I'm not saying that I'm not saying not to look into God's word in that point. Absolutely do. But if you wait, if you wait until trouble comes your way to start getting serious about Bible study and prayer, right? I mean, we all know, we all know that our prayer lives really ramp up when things are going south. When we're having problems, we start praying all of a sudden a lot, Lord, save me, like Peter did when he was sinking. But if we're already accustomed to knowing the voice of God through his word, then when those trials of life come our way, they're still difficult. There will still be natural doubt and fear. But there will also be an underlying sense of trust in your heart and mind that will hear and know the voice of God because it's already part of your life. I think that's what's happening here with Peter. It was a voice he recognized. It was a voice that he was already disciplined himself to learn to trust. It's a voice that you can follow. It's as if Peter was saying, if you are the great I am, if you are the great I am, then you can call me to do something I could never do without your power. And I believe that because I know your voice. And I can follow that voice in the midst of this storm in faith and obedience because I know that it's trustworthy already. If you're an all-powerful God, if you're a good God, here's what we can say, right, to the Lord. If that's true about you, God, then here's my yes. And I'm going to put it on the table. And I'm going to go wherever you want me to go. And I'm going to do whatever you want me to do. Even if I don't know what's going to happen, I'll get out of this safe boat. I'll get out of this place of safety. I'll leave this place. I'll do that. I'll do this. If it means that I get to walk with you. Now keep in mind, this is the same lake Peter was fishing in when Jesus first called him to be a disciple. Isn't that interesting? It's not the first time Peter heard Jesus tell him on this lake to come. Peter's probably thinking, you know, he's called me to follow him. He's led me this far. He's never let me down. I think I can follow him a little bit further because I know I can trust him. So I want to ask you today, are you listening? Number one, are you listening for God's voice? Are you listening for his voice? And I'm not, again, I'm not talking about audibly or, or in the stars. I'm talking about in his word. That's why we call it his word. It's his voice already spoken and written down. You know, what is he asking you to do? What, what is the Holy Spirit calling you to do? Maybe it's a hard conversation with a Christian friend living in sin. Maybe you need to come alongside them with gentleness and humility and respect and just say, listen, brother, or listen, sister, you know, I love you, but I also see this pattern in your life, and I, I'm worried and I'm concerned. And I just want to pray for you. I just want you to know I'm here for you. How can I help you? That's a hard conversation. It's awkward at first, 
But maybe that's what the Lord's calling you to have. Or maybe for some of us it's giving more generously to the church and, and to others in need. And not being so stingy with our money and giving away more to people who need it. Maybe it's being willing to go on the mission field and become a missionary. Maybe God's calling one of you to do that. And you've been turning away from it for years. Maybe it's just simply sharing the gospel with a non-Christian friend that you've been friends with for a long time and you know they don't know the Lord. But the Holy Spirit is calling you. His voice is saying to you to do this, to share the gospel. And so the question we have to ask is, are we listening? Are we listening to the Word of God? Are we following and doing what it says? You see an unrecognizable voice out there in the world? I wouldn't follow that. But the one who has called you to salvation, the one who is calling you to obedience, you can follow him, and you can trust that all day long. The fourth and final thing, the fourth and final conscious effort we have to make if we're going to trust God in the unknowns of life is this. We have to keep our eyes on him. Keep your eyes on him, right? Verse 30, but when, those, when, when Peter saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Now, how did he see, right? How, how did he see the effects of the wind? Because he took his eyes off of Christ. All of a sudden, the fear and the doubt that was there before when he thought Jesus may have been a ghost, it was all coming back to him really quickly. And it's funny how fickle we are, right? We, we get out of the boat. We go, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you in this unknown storm that's coming my way. I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to read your word. I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to talk to another Christian friend about it. I'm going to have support around me, and I'm going to go through this. But then we wake up the next day on the wrong side of the bed, so to speak, right? And then we're fickle all over again. And, 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 we, and we start to say, oh, I don't know it again. I don't know. I don't know if the Lord can really do this. I'm so scared. I'm so worried. I'm so anxious. And it's a roller coaster of emotion. Why? Because we keep turning our head. We keep turning our head away from what we know is true, that God is all-powerful and all-good and present in our storm, and we start to see the effects of the storm around us and putting our focus on those things instead of him. And that's what Peter was doing. You see, the key to perseverance, the key to faithfulness, the key to consistency in the Christian life is keeping our eyes and hearts fixed on Christ, no matter what. To not focus on the potential dangers, to not focus overly focus on those things that could cause trouble, but to put the primary focus on what we know to be true. I mean, how quick are we to forget who God is? And we forget who we are as his children. We forget the gospel. The author Paul Tripp calls it spiritual amnesia. We suffer from that, all of us. We're so quick to forget that we are more loved and accepted and approved of than we could ever imagine. And in light of the fact that we are so sinful and not worthy of that love, how could we ever forget the goodness of God in our lives? How can we ever forget that He lived and died as our substitute in our place? The life that I could never live, He lived for me. He lived for you. The death that you should die for your own sin. He was nailed to a cross for you as your substitute. And he rose from the grave to defeat the power of sin. That means that when you repent and turn to Christ to be your Lord and Savior, that sin no longer has to have that enslaving power over your heart and mind. You are free from that. You will still experience the struggles of sin. Yes, absolutely. But you're free from the enslaving power of it. You see, we forget that. We forget the gospel. We forget who God is. We forget that we're his beloved children. We start focusing on the peripheral things. We start focusing on the effects of the wind in our lives. And we begin to doubt again and again and again. We're so quick to name all the reasons that we shouldn't do something God's calling us to do. So between this spiritual amnesia and the distractions of this world, you know what? 
You ever feel like you're sinking? I mean, some of you right now, you are sinking. And you're overwhelmed with the anxiousness of a certain particular situation in your life, and you're sinking. And I promise that I'm not trying to scold you. I'm just trying to encourage you. To like Peter, it's not too late to call out and say, Lord, save me. I know that you have saved me. I know that I'm saved in terms of my salvation. But as your follower, in this moment, I am overwhelmed. I feel like I'm treading water, and I feel like I'm sinking. So, Lord, please save me from this situation. And I'm not asking you to remove the situation. I'm just asking you to lift me up so I can walk with you through it. If our eyes are fixed on the creation instead of the creator, then yes, we will sink. But as believers, when we do call out, you know He's always there. I mean, how many times have, has the Lord already done that in your life? Think about that, huh? If you've been walking with the Lord for a long time, you know. You've been sinking before. But you know His tender care and that gentle rebuke. Don't forget the rebuke, right? Right? Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? But even as he is gently rebuking you, he's also lifting you up. Only an all-powerful, good, gracious God can do that. But notice at the end of the story, what does Jesus do? Don't miss the end. When he and Peter get back in the boat, what happens? storm stops. The wind stops. And what was a terrible storm in the midst of that lake, all of a sudden there's calm and there's peace. Perhaps the clouds parted. Perhaps you could see the moonlight now shining on the water. In the stillness of the night, the disciples look at this man and declare, truly, you are the Son of God. You see, I think this tells us the storms of life are temporary. Number one, they're not going to last forever. They're not. And they're used by God, obviously, in His timing to shape us into who He wants us to be and who He created us to be. And these kinds of seasons of life, what, what is God ultimately doing in your heart? As you're sinking, as you're overwhelmed, as he lifts you up and fix your, fixes your eyes back on him and gently rebukes you and reminds you to never doubt and never have so little faith, when he lifts you up and he shapes you through that storm, ultimately what is he doing? He's leading you to worship. He's leading you to worship and to declare who he really is. He's leading us to a deeper understanding of who he is. And so I have to ask you this morning before we close, what's your unknown? What is the unknown in your life right now where you know you've been sitting there through this whole sermon and you're thinking, gosh, this is exactly what I needed to hear because the Lord knows that I am sinking right now. And if that's you this morning, I just want to encourage you, if you're experiencing more fear than trust, if you're experiencing more doubt than faith, to cry out like Peter, Lord, save me. Lord, I'm not asking you to remove this situation. I'm just asking you to let me keep my eyes fixed on you and walk with you through it. Trusting you all the way into the unknown, as painful as it may be. Lord, that you are good and you love me. And I know that's true because you've already given your life for me. Believe in his power. Be comforted by his presence. Follow his voice. And keep your eyes. Keep your eyes on him.